I know there are some people in here that are 12 years old. I started using drugs at the age of 12 years old. My name is Billy Schneider. Some of the present day things that are going on in my life with my health because of some of the choices that I made. That's what gave me the cancer. I have full blown AIDS. Ask me if it's fun. I couldn't come to my father and tell him, your best friend's a degenerate. He touched me while I was sleeping. I got some tough memories of this neighborhood. I shot heroin in and out of this area. Washington Heights, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, New Jersey. Got my first arrest, not too far from here, Nagel Avenue. I spent 10 years of my life in prison, I'll tell you that now, so I can help you to identify who's talking to you. Because I've been where you're at. So you're just not talking to Lottie Dottie or anybody. You're talking to a man who's been in prison for 10 years of his life, has started that track at the age of 12. You guys been watching Forrest Gump? You know, his mom lied to him. Said, Forrest, life is like a box of chocolates. You just never know what you're gonna get out of it. That's not the truth. There are only two pieces. Don't be misled by all the other little pieces. There's only two. There's the right piece and the wrong piece. And it's your choice. I understand this is supposed to be a religious class today, right? I'll tell you what religion meant to me. And I, I'll do that by way of showing you, for starters, my arms. And that's what I did religiously every day. I would wake up with a desire to do this drug called heroin. Ain't you guys bogged down with enough information? Huh? Listen, I'm not challenging information. I'm challenging your choices. This movie, you know why this movie is? So when I die, this story can continue to be told. And we'll begin with drugs. We'll begin with something else that happened to me. Something that it took me a long time to be able to accept myself and then ask God for the peace to be able to share with others. See, at 10 years old, my dad's best friend sexually molested me. He didn't make me do anything to him. He didn't do anything what you would call really dirty to me. But he touched me in areas that opened up my mind to a world I should have never been in. You know, I should have never been in that world called touch especially in your private parts, because it distorted my mind. I didn't think it, it felt good. That was a hard part for me to understand. I didn't like it, but at the same time, it felt good. Understand this, I was 10 years old. See, when my brothers and my parents found out what this guy was doing, they thought, because I didn't go to them, that I liked it. And I began to get labels. You queer, you faggot, you homo. You know, they say sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never harm you. They do. They hurt. I'd rather go through the pains of the chemotherapy and the cancer than go through the pains of some of the past. My mind became so warped. After that touch, I began to want to expose myself to pornography. I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that pornography, it destroys your mind. And once you begin to destroy your mind, you'll destroy your choices Things will look clouded. Things will become like, wow, what's wrong with it? You begin to accept things that are wrong. And then 30 years later, or 20 years later, or five years later, I've been in the schools where young people have told me, 16, 17 years old, 
full-blown AIDS. So you need to really be careful what you watch. And that's what happened in Billy Snyder at the age of 10. A filthy man with a dirty mind touched me somewhere and it opened up something that a child should be protected from. Feeling the abuse and not having the trust in my family. I come from a very dysfunctional family. There was uh, lots of violence, alcohol, um, sex, lots of crazy stuff for children to watch. I became very rebellious, um, wouldn't listen to my parents, although I was very fearful of my parents. My parents were very abusive physically. Education never really turned me on. I had the capability of becoming, you know, to, to learn. But whenever I did anything home, it never really pleased my dad. He was very, he was a, he was a tyrant. You know, you had to cross your T's and dot your I's or else you had to do your homework over again. And after a while, that becomes, a, that becomes stripping. It takes away from your self-esteem and your, you know, from your whole existence. I took on an attitude of wanting to be tough rebellious, uh, real wise guy. Back then they called it a punk. I don't know what you guys call it today, but that's what I began to become, a punk. Taken out into the streets with my friends. I did, uh, you know, I had, to, I had to find people that I can identify with. You know, they say birds with a feather flock together. Well, I had to find those birds. They were very easy to detect. You know, when you have pain, you can find someone else that's going through the same thing. The physical abuse continued, um, began to experiment, cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, sniffing airplane glue. I, I, have to, I have to update myself on some of the stuff you guys are sniffing, besides cocaine and heroin. But when I was younger, we were sniffing carbona, cleaning fluid. What are they doing now? They got these, these spray cans, what do they call it? Aerosol. No, they're not aerosol. What are the kids sniffing? Paint cans? Somebody help me. Somebody in here knows what. Huh? White out? They're sniffing white out? Yeah, that'll wipe you right out. Huh? Huffing gas. Huffing gas. Ain't that cool? Amico. Yo, if you smoke an Amico, there you go. <laughs> By show of hands, how many people in here smoke crack cocaine? We'll get the camera shot on this. This is before the lie. How many people in here know someone in here that's smoking crack cocaine? And this is after the lie. How many people in here Read pornography before the lie. How many people know someone that's reading pornography? You know, I was told birds with feather flock together, you know. If you know what they're doing, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Any alcoholics in here? You know? You raise your hand? Cool, man. Cool. I like your honesty. Do you know the, the quickest way to recovery is to recognize that you have a problem? Raise his hand, I'm an alcoholic. That's cool. There's hope for you, man. Now, let's do this. I want you guys to get this on camera. That's why they're here, Bill. How many people in this room know somebody personally that has been killed in an automobile accident within the last year and a half attributed to alcohol. Raise your hands. You miss your, whether you're friends, you up in the back. Whether you're friends, you miss them. Anybody down here closer so I don't have to holler? Anybody here had somebody die in an accident? Come on. You had your hand up. Didn't you? You didn't change your mind. 
You thought they died. <laughs> a, cousin. a cousin. You miss him? Well, I never met her. You never met her? Would you have liked to have the opportunity to meet her? Yeah. Isn't alcohol cool? Isn't that cool? You have a cousin you never met? It's not cool. The point I'm trying to make is it's not cool. So we already know that for a group of liars, we're making some bad choices. And if you're taking drugs, this is exactly where you're at. I don't care what that guy says. It's cool. Man, it makes me feel good. How can anything be wrong? If it feels that good, that's the lie. I believed that I was getting high. I found out later on, too late, maybe, that it's a lie. I was never getting high. I was coming down. I was going to the bottomless low. I thought it was a party. Now, I mean, everybody's party animals. I don't care from the 60s to the 90s. Partying is still partying. You guys with me? Huh? You guys still party today? If you think that you're having a party and you're sucking down the suds, maybe later on this guy will share with you the pain of alcoholism. The pain of it. I'll bet you 65% of my family has been wiped out because of alcohol. Any of you guys ever smoke crack cocaine? Huh? Where'd you start, man? I mean, your first drug was a cigarette. It didn't stop there, right? Did you drink after that? Did you smoke marijuana after that? See, it don't stop. It's like a hook. At 12 years old, I began smoking cigarettes, you know, and today when you start talking about drugs and you start to hit away on cigarettes, people think, oh, man, you know, I thought this guy was going to come here with a hardcore story about drugs, you know, the, the, the big stuff. But it's the little things that begin to, to, begin to build up cigarettes. <laughs> One of the most deadliest drugs you can do. Let me see the hands of the women that are smoking. If we were performing a surgical procedure right now to have your breasts removed, would you come up? Would you raise your hand and say, let me go next? You wouldn't, right? That's what cigarettes will do to you. I wish I could have my mom sitting here. My mom is in the final stages of emphysema. She's had half of her stomach taken out. She has no voice box, can never speak again. How many people like to come down for the other procedure that we're having here? It's called voice box removal. You'll never be able to talk again. You won't even sound as good as me. My mom had it done. I went to visit her in December. It was so frightening. I couldn't see her eyes. I couldn't see her nose. I couldn't see her mouth. She was so swollen. I went up to the nurse's station. I said, where's my mom's face? All because of cigarettes. You know, I wish I could label them in. I wish they could give me the job to label them things. They wouldn't be cools. Be fools. There's nothing cool about emphysema. There's nothing cool about not being able to communicate to your mom. You know, my mom picks up the phone or she'll talk to somebody and she uses this little machine and she says with a smile on her face, she tells everybody she's, her, she's the friendly neighborhood robot. It hurts. I keep promising myself that I'm going to take a picture of when my mom was 18 and show students. And serious, I mean, everybody's going to boast on their mom. My mom's the best cook in the world. My mom's this and my mom's this. 
Let me tell you my perspective. My mom was a fox. Huh? My mom was pretty. I look at her now and I see the results of the choices that she made in her own life. And I just see the effects of it. I'll tell you how cool marijuana is. 18 years old. June 27th, 1967. I stood in front of a judge on my 18th birthday, right in front of my mom. I'll never forget, I looked at the clock and I said, in another 20 minutes, 18 years ago, a doctor handed me to my mother and says, here's your baby. And here I am in front of my mother 18 years later, <laughs> handcuffed and shackled. And I thought, how does that make her feel? <laughs> to watch her baby get taken off the state prison. I'm not talking about a correctional facility, I'm talking about a state prison for three years of my life for $5 worth of marijuana. Ain't that cool? No, it's not cool. But it took me time to wake up I got out of prison, man. You know what I started doing? The same old, same old. The same thing. Nothing changed in my mind. So I go from marijuana, taking LSD, taking speed, taking cocaine. And then I took heroin. I used to think, man, man, heroin's cool. It's a cool drug, till it made me sick. I didn't feel, I didn't feel the hook. See, I didn't feel that hook. I didn't know it. Man, but that heroin led me down a path that destroyed my life. I'd say maybe 40, 40, 45, maybe 50 of my friends are dead and buried. All I know is my childhood friends, the same guy I'm looking at right now, I see my, the eyes of Carlos Campana, who's dead. I had the same kind of eyes, man. And I could look around and I see people that remind me of someone that's dead. I look at you, my friend, and I see my son. Don't he look like my son? I mean, really, take a look at that. Huh? Couldn't he resemble? Huh? He's been missing for four and a half years. They speculated that he's been murdered here in New York City. And I look at him and I say, my son made wrong choices. I look at other gals and I say, man, they look like Linda. I'll show you a picture of my first wife. Later on, come to me, I'll show you. I say, she reminds me of Linda. The one I held in my arms on December 8th, 1992. And I whispered into her ear just before she died, let go, baby. Please let go. Hepatitis killed her. You know where you get hepatitis from? You can get hepatitis from a dirty needle. Or you can get hepatitis from alcohol. The progressive disease of hepatitis is called cirrhosis of the liver. And that's what she died from. She looked like she was about 11 months pregnant when she died. Her stomach was out the ear. You know why? Because her body wasn't passing. Her fluids. That meant she couldn't urinate. And I'd go visit her here in Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. 
and I'd hear her cry out, please drain me. Please have the doctors come in and drain me. I said, they didn't drain you today? She said, no, I haven't gone to the bathroom in four days. Could you imagine what it must feel like? Your liver's not working, your kidney's not working, and all that fluid builds up. Listen to me. I want you to listen to me. I can tell you what it sounded like. I can tell you what it looked like when they came into our room and they stuck a needle about this big right into our stomach. And they would pull the urine out of our stomach. Please, listen to me, man. I got something to tell you about some of your choices you're making. They're foolish. Don't wake up like I did one day and say, what did I do? I was an idiot. I believed in a lie. In 1977, I was messed up, strung out. I needed help, I wanted help. I was on the methadone program. I've been on methadone seven times in my life. It was a drug designed to take me off of heroin, but it was another drug. I was still addicted. My counselor, this man was getting $18,000 a year to help me. In my mind, to get me off of drugs. He was cool. He was my friend. You know why he was cool and he was my friend? He was selling me cocaine. My counselor. I was so trapped. I wanted off of drugs. I needed off of drugs. On March 11, 1977, I climbed to the top of the George Washington Bridge. 450 feet in the air. I smelled the traffic for five hours. The headlines in the news. Man climbs bridge and plea for help. They promised me they wouldn't put me in a mental institution. When I gave in and I came down, they handcuffed me, put me into a police car, and it took me directly to Bellevue Hospital. It's the largest psychiatric hospital in the world. And off I went. And I said, man's nothing but a liar. They promised me they wouldn't take me to a mental institution. They shot me up with Dorothy. For five days I walked around like this. I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be okay. That's all I could tell myself to keep myself together. When the doctor signed the papers to put me upstairs, he says to me, you don't care. He says, you don't call climbing 450 feet in the air crazy. I said, no, I don't. What I call crazy is that's what I had to do to get somebody to listen to me. I need help. I want help. Why can't somebody help me without another drug? Why do you got to keep sticking needles in my arm? I started to understand, man, that there was something that was lacking. So when my friend came to me and this guy started sharing the gospel, you know, before I became a Christian, I used to think gospel was black music. I didn't know that the word gospel simply means this, the good news. For 18 years, I rejected it. I don't need no Jesus. Don't give me that Jesus stuff. But Jesus loves you. I said, who cares? So's my old lady. So's my girlfriend. I had a different concept of love. I never realized that love is total sacrifice. That would be the only display of love that I could recognize as being real. If I said, man, I love you, dude. I want to do your time for you. You'd have to identify that if I said, hey, let this guy free and let me do his time. That would be a commitment, a sacrifice. I would be willing to suffer your pain. I rejected that message for 18 years. Here I was in the streets of New York, strung out. 
I just got finished doing five years straight in state prison in New Jersey. 60 days later, I was addicted again. I had no outstanding cases, no charges, no warrants. I was a free man, but I was still locked up in here. I was in a spiritual prison. Now I was still empty. I was still searching for something. And I thought I could find him in a drug. New York City, five days in a row it rained. Cold, snowy, sleet, freezing. My socks were so wet, my sneakers were so wet, my pants were filled with ice. I was cold, and I found myself in an abandoned building. And the rats and everything are running around, man, and the smell from people using this place to, to, to urinate, to defecate. Dirty mattresses, blood all over the walls from people injecting up. Dead cats, dead rats. It stunk, but it wasn't wet. And I sat upon a nasty mattress. I'll never forget, I laid a piece of newspaper down. I took my shoes off. I took my socks off to wring out my socks. And I looked at the bottom of my feet and I started to cry. They all shriveled up from being wet, from walking the streets for five solid days looking for another fix, looking for another low. And I started to cry. And I started to ask myself, what about Jesus? What about that message I heard? I need somebody to prove to me they love me, even the way I am right now. Even in the condition I'm in right now. I smelt, I was undernourished, I was unhealthy. My mind was filled with garbage. I said, who could love me the way I am now? You know, Billy Joel, you guys know who Billy Joel is? He sings this song, I love you just the way you are. He stole those words from Jesus Christ. And on Valentine's Day, 1987, Jesus Christ knocked on my heart and I accepted that. And that was 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago. And I gotta share this with you guys. I made some bad choices, but the best choice I ever made was to follow Christ. He never led me down a beaten path. I never opened up my arm for another drug. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't lie. I know him. I know what peace he gave me. That's why I'm not gonna go stick nothing in my arm. We have choices. Every day I have a choice. I have a choice to submit to my will or not. This is not just about Christianity. It's talk about life and real choices. That you, you, you are going to be responsible for. You may be going through a struggle, but if you run from it, man, it runs just as quick as you do. I realize that now. Man, whatever you're running from is going to catch up. Because don't be one of those people that'll sit here today and say, but that, what's happening to Billy, is never going to happen to me. Because I'm cool. I was cool too.